got that. A hug might be a good. You got this. Come on! You got this! You got this. Dear Jesus. You got this. I want to invite you into my heart. Miss Douglas, they're ready for you. You got this. Hey. Where's Josh? We're going to take a minute here just to pause and say thank you to Dad. So we're going to do something. Um, if you could, um, I want all the dads to stand up, if you don't mind. Awesome. And so if you know any of these guys, I want you to stand and crowd around them. What we're going to do is we're going to take a second to pray over our dads, over the men in this church. So whether your dad is here or not today, that's okay. Pray for the guy next to you. Come on, stand up, huddle around. As guys, we need support. As guys, we need encouragement. We just sang and confessed that and what we are worshiping to. We're saying, Lord, I need you. Lord, we want our souls to be set on fire by God. And so we're going to take a second to uh, pray. So, sorry, I'm being weird and awkward so I can see everybody. All right. And again, if it's not your dad, it's okay. Lay his shoulder on a friend, on the guy next to you. Because here's the thing. As Christians, we're all in this together. We're all in one family. And so we're going to lift up every single dad, every single guy. Even if you're not a dad yet, we're praying for men. Okay? So let's do that now. So Jesus, thank you so much for all these guys in this place today. Thank you so much for all these men, for all these fathers, for all these husbands. Jesus, we so desperately need you in every capacity of our lives, to be more and more of the guys you have called us to be. God, thank you that you are constantly working on us, that you are constantly refining us. You're never done with us. Lord, thank you for the families that you've placed around us, the support you've put around us. First and foremost, Lord, thank you for Jesus, that he showed us what the ultimate guy looks like, a gracious, loving, forgiving, compassionate, merciful person who is a servant leader, who is willing to lay down his life. God, may that be what we are as men. May we be people who love, who forgive without boundaries. Lord, who lay down our lives for those around us, who do the right thing. God, it's so hard, but thank you for the people who stand next to us. Lord, thank you for the people around these men right now, for the, the moms, the spouses, the wives, the kids, the, the sons, the daughters, the uncles, the grandparents. Lord, thank you that we are truly a family, a community of people who care about each other. So, Lord, I pray that no matter what kind of things we might be carrying with us, Lord, as dads, Jesus, what you say to us today is that you love us, you affirm us, you call us your sons, you call us into a new life, you call us into the new way that you've given us hope through what you accomplished on the cross by defeating sin and death and the devil. So no matter what, maybe is hanging over us. God, you give us freedom, you give us life, and we thank you for that. So Lord, I pray for every dad, for every father, for every soon-to-be father, um, Lord, that we would constantly be your image bearers, that we would be people who show your love and your compassion and forgiveness and everything. So Jesus, thank you for these guys, and I pray that they would feel affirmed, that they would feel loved, and that they would just be reminded of how special and how important their calling is in life. Lord, we thank you for being our ultimate perfect father, Jesus, and we pray and ask all these things in Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Amen.
You may have a seat. Thank you, Josh, for praying for me and the other dads here. And I hope that video was a blessing, not just to inspire us as dads to tell our kids and to continue to encourage our, our kids. And maybe some diaper changing thoughts are going on in your head too. Um, but I pray that you all hear that today. Right. Today is Father's Day, and this is a time where we get to reflect on our Heavenly Father, and our Heavenly Father continues to tell you and me, right, you got this. You got this. Right. He continues to encourage us, and so, brothers and sisters, I don't know if I've ever called you that before, but we are children of our Heavenly Father. Right. You got this. You got this. Whatever it is that's going on in your heart, and your life, right, you got this. He is with you. So as we get ready to continue our sermon series called Strike the Arrow, I want to draw our attention to Matthew chapter 9. It says this, this is Jesus, while he was saying these things, while Jesus was saying these things to him, behold, a ruler came in and knelt before him, a dad, a dad came in and knelt before him saying, my daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her and she will live. And so Jesus rose and followed him with his disciples. And behold, on their way, a woman who had suffered from a discharge of blood for 12 years, came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment, his seat, his prayer shawl. Right? And she said to herself, if only I touch his garment, his prayer shawl, I will be made well. And then Jesus turned and seeing her, he said, take heart, daughter. Right? I love it that he calls her daughter. Right? Your faith has made you well. You struck the arrow by faith. It's made you well, and when Jesus came to the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion, he said, go away, for the girl is not dead but sleeping. And then they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put aside, outside, he went in and took her by the hand and the girl arose and the report of this went through all that district. And so we are in a sermon series called Strike the arrow, strike the arrow, comes from an Old Testament uh, encounter that a prophet had with a, a king. And the prophet called the king to have faith, and the king did not have faith. And so he limited striking the arrow, but our call is that we don't limit striking the arrow, that we continue to have faith. And today we're going to talk about faith to fight. The faith to fight. And each week through the sermon series, we're looking at this great chapter in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 11. And we're looking at somebody or some moment that took place where... God says in his word, by faith. By faith this happened. In Hebrews 11, verse 30, it says, By faith the walls of Jericho fell down. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down. Some of us are familiar with that story from the Old Testament, but it was a, a moment right, in the history of God's children where God wants to put his children into the promised land. That he promised them so that they could live out their purpose to be a light into this world. The promised land area was really the highway of the ancient world, and so everybody was going through there, so God needed to strategically put his children there so that they could tell the whole world who their father was and is, and that the whole world is God's children. But in order for God's children to get there, they needed to go through a fortified city called Jericho, and Jericho was this place that was deemed untouchable. And as we talk about Jericho, what history tells us, and even what the Bible tells us, is that the promised land was full of, of people who were totally against God. Evil, worshiping false idols, just didn't want anything to do with God, living complete lives. And certainly they were still God's children, but yet God, the way he needed to do his thing, was he needed to move them out of the land. Right? He needed to inhabit his own land with people that loved him so that he could bless the whole world. But the walls of Jericho is an untouchable place. What God tells his children to do by faith, he says, march around this fortified city. Right? I think a lot of us, when we think about fighting, right, this is not the way we think about fighting. And so God calls them just to simply march. Do this half mile march around this fortified city seven days in a row. Get repetitious about it. Right? Show me that you got a habit. Right? Be consistent and just be fervent. Be persevering. Do it seven days in a row. It doesn't make sense, but just do it because this is what faith does. It listens to me. And then the seventh day, march around it seven times. So go ahead and do a 5K. Next time you're doing a 5K, anybody, think about the walls of Jericho. Do a 5K and then blow the trumpets and then the walls are going to come down. Right? And so the walls come down. Right? And Joshua and Caleb lead the next generation into the promised land. And so the question 
that I had to wrestle with as we were putting this sermon series together as I was studying these scriptures and this story specifically passed down to us to encourage us is how does this apply to us? How does this apply to us? And, and the big question is how do we break down walls by faith? How do we break down walls by faith? And as I think about that, the question is, how do I lead others into the promised land? Right? The promised land, what we know to be true as disciples of Jesus, that the promised land is Him. A relationship with Him, wherever He is, that is the promised land. Because Jesus said, come to me, you who are weary and burdened. I will give you rest. And the promised land is a place of rest. It's a place of a peace that surpasses all human understanding. Right? That's a relationship with Him. And so how do we right, march around the walls in such a way that they break down so the next generation would be in the promised land, would be in a relationship with him, that the gates of hell right, would be knocked down. And as we read that gospel lesson, as we started the message, and we hear this dad whose daughter is sick, in fact, she's dead, right, we see this example on his Father's Day of how we do that. What did he do? Right, he knelt before Jesus and interceded for his daughter. He prayed for his daughter. Right? Intercessory prayer. Right? That's how we knock down walls. That's how we lead others. That's how we fight the physical spiritually. Right? Intercessory prayer. Right? In First Chronicles, we hear about this king, King David, and that he's actually interceding for his son Solomon. And so we have this intercessory prayer to set the stage for teaching us how to intercede for others, how to fight battles for others. It's in 1 Chronicles 29, verse 19, where David prays this prayer, Grant to Solomon, my son, a whole heart, that he may keep your commandments, your testimonies, and your statues. Right? We are called to pray. Dads, right? if there's one lesson I've learned this past year, is that there is power in prayer. Right? If there's one lesson I've learned in 13 years of being a dad, right? I would give this to you, I would share this with you. If I've seen God work in any way, it's been this. Moms, grandparents, right? anybody here that wants to help others and fight for others, right? it's about praying for others. That's where it begins. That's where it starts. And what I love about prayer as we get into this now right, is that we have a Savior. His name is Jesus, in case you're wondering, and he, he taught us how to pray. Right? His first disciples came to him and said, Jesus, teach us how to pray. And so Jesus taught them. And we have this prayer now that we call the Lord's Prayer that's been passed down to us through the Scriptures and now today. And many of us pray this prayer. And oftentimes it becomes very repetitious. In fact, Jesus spoke against vain repetition in it. Right? But as I think about walking around those walls of Jericho being repetitious, I can't help but think about the Lord's Prayer. What we understand was that Jesus didn't want it to be vain repetition. He actually taught it as an outline as an outline, but certainly there's power in just praying it. But he taught us as an outline. In fact, for those of us who have been uh, familiar with the Lutheran Church for quite some time, any time, right, we've probably seen the catechism. What we know is Martin Luther, right, asked that question because he understood it as an outline as he was trying to catechize, disciple those around him in his day and age and still today, right? So he'd always ask the question, what does this mean? So that we actually didn't pray this prayer with vain repetition, that we could pray it as an outline, but not just personally. What I've learned in my own life in the last 20 years, and specifically this last year even more so, is to use it as the outline for intercessory prayer. And so the Lord's Prayer. Right, I love it that Jesus came to show us the Father and that he shows us the Father in such a way that when he taught us how to pray, right, you begin with our Father in heaven, our Father who art in heaven. What does it look like if we actually use it as an outline to actually intercede for others? Well, I love that the scriptures are full of intercessory prayer. This is the first time in, in my life, actually, where I've really dug into the scriptures to see if there's intercessory prayer. Over the last couple of weeks, there's thousands, actually, of prayers that are interceding for others. It's quite amazing, to be honest with you. And the Apostle Paul, perhaps using this as an outline, Right, praise for the church in Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14. The prayer begins there, but he says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father. And if we had time, we go at the other verses. But he's saying this reason before the Father is that you would know the love of the Father. That you would know how high 
How wide, how deep is the love of the Father that surpasses all human understanding. And when I think about that, when I begin to pray for my own children, the prayer is simple. May they know your love. May they know your love, Father. May my love or, or lack thereof in their lives, may it not get in the way of your love. May it just be a little flicker of the huge light of your love. I'm not perfect, but you are. May they know your love. And when I say no, it's experience, right? Not just knowledge, but experience. May they experience your love. May they know your love. Simple. Right? The next petition that Jesus taught was, hallowed be your name. Holy is your name. Right? Moses prayed that God would show him his glory. God, show me your presence. Show me your holiness. Show me your glory. Show me your kavod. And God shows up and shows that to him. But then Moses intercedes for the children of Israel, his brothers and sisters, and says, God, show them your glory. You showed it to me, now show it to them. Show them your presence. And so we hear Moses saying this in Exodus chapter 34, verse 9. If now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, please let the Lord go in the midst of us. Please show them your glory. The Shekinah glory is what we call it when we look at the Old Testament. The glory of God in the tabernacle, in the tent of meeting, but also the glory of God in the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. Right? Show them your glory. Right? My prayer for my children is, may they see your glory. May they see your holiness. Um, little Oliver, I think, is the only one out of my kids that still thinks I'm a superhero. Maybe he doesn't now. Maybe he'll tell me that after the service. If he's here right now, I think he's here. Right? But may they see your glory. Right? May, they show your, may they see your godness. May they see the immeasurably more in your life. Right? Again, may I get out of the way. May they see you. Right? You are with them. I love it that Jesus calls that woman who had faith enough to touch his prayer garment, right? his daughter. Right? May my children experience, not just know, but may they experience your godness, your healing power, your glory, your presence in their lives. May they touch the hem and may they feel that power that comes from you in their lives. Because hallowed be your name. May your name be holy. May they know your glory. Right? So Jesus continues to teach. The next petition in the Lord's Prayer, if you're with me, is your kingdom come. Right? Your kingdom come. Right? The Apostle Paul says it this way as he's praying, as he's interceding for his brothers and sisters, his blood relatives. He says it in Romans chapter 10, verse 1. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them, so he's talking to the church in Rome about the Israelites, is that they may be saved. That they may be saved, that your kingdom would come in their lives. So Father in heaven, may your kingdom come. May my children know your salvation. May they know you. May they experience you. May they walk with you. And certainly someday may they receive the greatest gift of all, that is heaven. That is heaven. But may your kingdom, may your work be manifested in their lives now. May they walk with you. May they know your kingdom. Right, the next petition in the Lord's Prayer, I think it's up on the screen right now. If you want it, you can say it with me just so I know that you're with me right now. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Right, Colossians chapter 1, Paul's interceding for the disciples in Colossia and he says, and so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, to intercede for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. May they know your will. May they know your purpose. All right, my children, I think they know my will. Do they listen to me? I wish. Maybe they tithe to me. 10% they listen to me. Right? right? But may they know your will. May they know your purpose for them. May they have discernment. Right? You have spoken to them. May they know that. May your will be done. May your purpose be done in their lives. I know you've created them. You love them so much. And you have a plan for them. May they know your will. May they live out your will. May they bring heaven 
down here to earth so that others see you through them. May they know your will. So the next petition is what? Give us this day our daily bread. Right? That's a super familiar petition to us. That's something that many of us just probably simply pray quite a bit, maybe around the dinner table. Thank you for our daily bread. Right? And certainly there is power in that simplicity of that. Right? God provide for me food, clothing, shelter. Just provide. Right? But what we know about Jesus is that he did teach the Lord's Prayer a couple different times just in the Scriptures. I'm sure he taught it more because any teacher needs to do that over and over again, repetitive. Right? You've got to walk around those walls quite a bit. Right? But in the Gospel of Matthew, as Jesus teaches in the midst of the Sermon on the Mount, he emphasizes the next petition, which we're not there yet, but he emphasizes the forgiveness of sins. So he expounds on that a little bit after he's done teaching it. And the Gospel of Luke, when Luke records at this time when Jesus teaches, he actually emphasizes this petition in the Lord's Prayer. And when Jesus emphasizes this, he begins to actually take us way deeper than we ever thought we could go. And he actually says, when you're praying for daily bread, pray for more of the Spirit. That's your daily bread. The Holy Spirit is what sustains you and what gives you life. Pray for more of the Holy Spirit as you pray for daily bread. And so the disciples heard this, and so they're praying for the Holy Spirit anywhere and everywhere for others throughout the epistles. But in the book of Acts, we see the disciples show up on the scene in Acts 8, verse 15, and it says that they came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Right? Father, may they know your Spirit. May they experience your Spirit. If you were with us last week, we talked about the Spirit and how the Spirit's not a spirit of fear, but the Spirit's a spirit of power, right? of power, of dynamite. The Spirit's a spirit of love, of sacrifice, of commitment. Right? The Spirit's a spirit of self-control, of perseverance, right? to stay the course even when life gets hard. May they know your Spirit. Right? May they know your fruits of the Spirit. The fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. May they experience your Spirit in their lives. What would this look like if we would pray this prayer how Jesus taught us for others? The next petition, right? Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And so Jesus actually interceded for others while he was on the cross. He's interceding for the Roman soldiers that just crucified him. He's interceding for the religious leaders that didn't believe in him and hated him and had so much envy that they wanted him crucified. He's interceding for his disciples that aren't there, that have abandoned and betrayed him. When he says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Forgive us our trespasses, right? Father, may they know your forgiveness. But it doesn't stop there because it's as we forgive those who trespass against us. And so Romans 15, 5, right? Paul says this. This is his prayer for the church in Rome. May the God of endurance and encouragement, right? The God who's always saying, you got this. You got this, right? Grant you to live in such harmony. And at the root of harmony, you know what's at the root of harmony? Forgiveness. Right? If there's going to be unity, if there's going to be oneness, there's got to be forgiveness. There's got to be confession. There's got to be, I, I forgive you, I'm sorry, I forgive you, I forgive you, I'm sorry. Right? With one another in accord with Christ Jesus, because in accord with Christ Jesus, we forgive as we have been forgiven. And so may they know your forgiveness. May they know your forgiveness. Everybody certainly needs to know this and experience it. Right, so they don't get guilt, stuck in guilt and shame. But some people have more of a personality of a perfectionist. Right? And you know what happens in the perfectionist soul and mind more so than others? Right? Devastation when they see their imperfections. Right? But no matter what our personality type, may we know your forgiveness. May we not, may my children not get stuck in guilt and shame. May they know that they are forgiven by you. And may they forgive each other. May Chloe forgive Oliver. May Oliver forgive Graham. May Toby forgive Oliver. <laughs> right? May they forgive each other. May there be harmony in their lives. But even more than that, anybody and everybody may they forgive. And certainly may they forgive me. Right? Dads, right? may they forgive us. 
Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. May they know your forgiveness, not just for themselves, but may they experience it as they give it to others. The next petition is, lead us not into temptation. Right? The Apostle Paul says this to the church in Rome, it's my prayer that your love, I mean to the church in Philippi, sorry about that, it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Knowledge, discernment, so that you would know what is excellent, that you be pure and blameless. Right? Lead us not into temptation. Right? Jesus, when he was tempted in the desert in those 40 days right before he was baptized, right, revealed to us in the scriptures in the gospel of Matthew, how did Jesus fight against temptation? How did he remain pure and blameless? How did he have discernment against the lies of the devil? God's word. Right? And so I find myself praying this petition. May they know your word. May my children know your word. So that they can fight against temptation. And the next petition is deliver us from evil. Deliver us from the evil one. And Jesus uh, prayed this in John 17 as he interceded for his disciples, as he interceded for us. Right? Protect them from the evil one. Right? But in Ephesians chapter 6, as Paul talks about you address the physical with the spiritual, right? the armor of God, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit, the belt of truth, the feet fitted with the gospel of peace, right? those boots. Right? You apply this all when you pray. The spiritual battle happens when you pray, and at the end of this teaching, he, he reveals this. He says, pray at all times in the spirit, with all prayer and supplication. The word supplication there is intercession. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication, perseverance, walk around those walls over and over and over and over again, making supplication, intercession for all the saints. All right, Father, may they know your protection. May they know your protection in the spiritual battle that exists. May they know that your spirit that is in them that is greater than he that is in this world. May they know the God of angel armies that is fighting for them. May they know your protection. Right? And the Lord's prayer ends with, Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And certainly when I, when I pray that, right, it's God, may they know you. May they know you. I know that you are God. May they know that you are God. And I want to say quite simply this. This is how we fight our battles. This is how those that have gone before us have fought their battles. We pray. In marriage, we pray for each other. With our enemy, we pray for our enemy. Right? For anybody and everybody, right? we pray. That's how we fight for others. And so may we strike that arrow. And may the walls come down. As we strike this arrow for others, it is Father's Day, and I love it that we get to look at the Lord's Prayer and Jesus teaching us about this relationship that we have, that we get to address God as Father, because He is our Father. And I see a lot of dads out there. I don't know what kind of dad you are. I applaud you for being here by faith. Right? It tells me something about your heart and your mind. I look at all of you and I see children, not just little kids, but all of us have had earthly fathers. And what I know to be true is that we have a perfect father. None of us dads are perfect. None of our dads were perfect. Right? But Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. And so what do we know is true about our Heavenly Father? Right, we know that He is always with us, that He's not against us, He's for us. We know that He's spoken to us. Right, he's written it down for us. His Word is living and active. And we know that our Father is always listening to us. He's always listening to us. And that our Father is powerful. Because right, when He listens, He responds. Right, that's our Father. May you and I, may we continue to strike the arrow. May our Father is listening, and may we fight for others. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen? Amen. Amen. If you please bow your heads and pray with me. And so, gracious Father, we thank you on this Father's Day that we get to honor dads, and, and we certainly we, we do that. But even more than that, we thank you that you are our Heavenly Father. 
We thank you that, that what was prophesied about Jesus for thousands of years from the prophet Isaiah, that in him we'll see the everlasting Father, that we've seen the Father because we've seen Jesus. And we know these truths to be true because Jesus rose again from the dead. And so in this moment, as we continue to be your disciples and sit at your feet, as we continue to learn how to pray, we do pray the Lord's Prayer together, and we pray that it wouldn't just be vain repetition, but that we learn how to pray this prayer, not just between us and you, but for others also. And so please join me in praying the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.